Hi everyone, and welcome along to this webinar from Data Og Development. My name is Barry Dunn and I'm a GDA for the Western Division with Data Og. I hope you're all keeping well. It's been a, obviously been a really strange time over the last few weeks, um, but um, it, it's, it's funny how quickly everybody can adjust to the new reality and it looks like this will continue for another while. So we felt it would be a good time to maybe do um, a short webinar regards to what clubs can actually do during the shutdown. So as things stand, uh, it looks like the shutdown will probably continue for at least another two to four weeks. And, and, and in realistic terms, when things get going again after that, it will be quite a while before um, activity resumes on the pitch for, for juvenile clubs and for adult clubs. So we'll get cracking. This should be about 30, 35 minutes. Um, if there's, uh, like I said, if there's any questions that people have at the end of this, um, by all means, just fire ahead, uh, send them on to us, and we'll be more than happy to try and, uh, and answer the questions. So anybody in the games development staff, if there's any questions arising over that, that we cover in this uh, presentation. So first of all, I'll just do very briefly talk about myself, just to give a bit of context to uh, where I'm coming from. So I, um, I'm obviously a member of the Clash Monkey Kinsale Bay GA Club. Um, I'm a very bad junior hurler and footballer with the club. I'm also involved in the administrative side of things as coaching officer. Um, and then I'm also from time to time involved with various teams as a coach as well over the last few years. Uh, I'm obviously working full time for Desha Og and I have been a full time staff member for three years now. Uh, I originally started working with Desha Og back in March of 2015. So I'm coming up on my fifth year working with Desha Og. Um, it's a job I really, really enjoy. It's great to get out and meet people in clubs and schools and in coaching courses. So there's 14 clubs in the Western Division, 29 primary schools, there's four post-primary schools. So obviously that keeps you busy each day. And then on top of that then as well, I'm also the coach education coordinator for Tasha Oak, which means that I organize foundation courses, award one courses, award two courses, and also any workshops that we organize throughout the year. Um, in addition to that, so as well, when I would have started with Desha Og, I also did a strength and conditioning 18-month um, uh, degree with Stanta College. Previous to that, uh, as a younger man, I did a degree in economics and finance in, in Water Institute of Technology. I really enjoyed the course, but also it was fantastic to, to play um, play Sigerson football and to be exposed to training in, in a in a High performance environment, I suppose, it, with colleges football, but also as my first involvement um, with um, with coaching teams as well. I was involved as, as a coach with our current games manager, actually Owen Bernock, um, as coach to an O'Connor Cup team um, in the college. And um, also, then around twelve years ago, I would have played for a summer over in Sean Tracy's GA club over in San Francisco. So all of those parts kind of make up who I am as a coach and. Um, and probably influence the way that I actually go about my job. So what will we be discussing tonight on this webinar? <clears throat> so basically, all we're, it's a very practical presentation. We don't want, uh, we're not going to be covering every angle. We just said we kind of hone in on two specific side of things. So we'll be looking at things that clubs can do in practical terms from an administrative perspective and also from the point of view of coaching. So we'll, throughout the presentation, we'll be discussing challenges and opportunities um, that we're faced with during the shutdown. Also emphasising that now is a good time for coaches and clubs to reflect and to plan for the future, because I suppose when things get going on the field, it, it can be quite tricky for, um, for us to find the time to, to plan and to stay on top of what the club is doing and, and how we can actually continue doing things into the future. And I suppose the main thing that we want to, to get clubs to ask themselves is like, how can we as a club come out the other side of this as strongly as possible? Um, because obviously the temptation is to, um, to maybe just do nothing at all. And, and that, that can be completely fine if clubs decide to do that. But it's just also to highlight that there are things that you can do to keep busy and to keep things ticking over. So one thing that we felt that was really a point that's really important to make as well for this presentation is, is that we're essentially going through an unprecedented time in the GA. I suppose you don't need, I don't have a comparison really in my lifetime, but I, I would know from talking to, to people, they said that, you know, this is probably similar to a war time situation whereby, you know, there's no championships being played, there's no collective training going on, there's, you know, 
there's not there wasn't really any meetings going on in a wartime scenario so that's kind of the situation that we're in whereby everybody is is uh, living in isolation so that prevents collective training there's no competitions there's such no activity of any sort really uh, going on in the club so it's a it's a new uh, it's a new situation that we're faced with and i suppose we all we're all trying to figure out our best way to get around this um there's no expectation of clubs coaches or administrators to implement all or any of these suggestions all they are is suggestions it's just something to that might trigger a few things that might spur a few clubs to kind of come on and maybe try something different and, and that's all we want we're, we're not at all putting pressure on on, on people to have to do uh, additional work at a time that is quite stressful and i suppose something else to highlight as well is that people are going through a really difficult period personally and professionally so we all need to be aware and considerate when dealing with people so that person that you normally uh, ring up and bounce ideas off could be going through a very very tough time at work or they could be at home with three or four kids and 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 homeschooling might have them driven demented and and they just might not be in a headspace where they want to kind of help out with the club and that is completely fine so it's just a case of something to probably be mindful of whenever you are contacting people that there's probably a lot going on and that we just want to make sure that we're not negatively impacting um on 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 people with the way they kind of go about things so to start off, we were kind of saying a, a good thing just to get the ball rolling from a club's point of view is something simple, organise a conference call between your committee or and by all means invite your coaches on as well. Um, so there's obviously different types of, of software that you can use. Um, you can use Microsoft Teams, which is the, the um, specific app which the GA recommends that you use, but you can also use Zoom and you can also use Skype, I suppose. Um, a big thing when using um, any uh, video conferencing uh, program or video conferencing app is to just make sure that you build in uh, security and protection for yourself so whereby it's always a good idea to maybe put a password on a meeting and to obviously be able to vet the people that are going to to maybe limit the, the number of um, uh, invitations that you send out for a particular call so maybe it might be just it's just something to be kind of wary of when you're kind of sending out emails on that so first thing I would do is probably just maybe discuss the current situation in relation to the club and how best the club can deal with it. So each club is going to have a unique set of circumstances that they're facing into. It could be coming from an urban background, a rural background, uh, might have lots of playing numbers, and it might have that many playing numbers, whatever. Each club is going to have a unique, uh, will be in a unique situation, and they'll also their response to that situation will also be unique. So try and find out the best, um, best situation or the best solution for your own situation. So a big part of that call then obviously is trying to create a list of action points that you feel you can work on um, and then set tasks for various people um, to, to, to work on to get those done. And maybe set a time frame for the people to work towards then as well, because obviously if you have just an indefinite target or an indefinite goal, it probably means that somebody says, ah, sure, look, I can maybe get, get onto that in a couple of months, whereby it's probably no harm to maybe set some kind of a deadline for people to kind of work towards to give them something to kind of focus in on. Um, yeah, so then we'll just move on to the administration side of things. <clears throat> so from an administrative perspective, <clears throat> the first thing you should probably do is, is really have a look at how your club structures are working. Are your club structures functioning well? It might be a good idea to just check in with your club officers to see if they need support because very often people will take on a new role and, and once they have the role then it's like the club says, ah sure, look, they're fine, now they can kind of work away on that. Whereas you know, sometimes club officers will need a hand or they need a little bit of guidance in what, what they're doing. Like this is particularly the case if you, if you have new club officers. So obviously around this time of year, in the last two to three months, we would have seen um, AGMs taking place and you would have maybe new chairpersons, new treasurers, new secretaries, new coaching officers, registrars, whoever. So for every person who might be very comfortable in doing the job or who might have held a different role on a committee, you'll have somebody who's completely new to it and who needs a little bit of guidance. So it's just, I suppose, showing that person that, you know, look, if you need a hand, we're there. Or if you need a little bit of guidance, whatever, we're more than happy to help out so that they don't feel like that they're on their own. And obviously there's resources available then for all club officers as well. In fairness, in the last year or two, the GA has been very strong in promoting, um, particularly online content, 
to act as a guide for people who are taking over new roles in the club. And obviously there's a, a, your development officer in each county then will have a role to play in, in providing backup for, for your club from an administrative point of view. So try and establish regular contact amongst the committee members. Regular contact could be something as simple as a text message, a phone call every couple of weeks just to check in with somebody and just to see if, if everything's okay with them and there's something that you can kind of work on. Or it could be going back to saying, look, do you know what, we're going to hold a conference call every three to four weeks uh, for the next two to three months while things are shut down, just to stay in contact and to make sure that there's no nothing that has happened in the intervening period that we don't deal with or, or, or that you're not on top of things, essentially. So player registration. Now is a great time to ensure that all your juvenile players are registered and on the online system. So the GA uses a system called Service Sport. Uh, your club registrar will probably be very familiar with this system. It's, um, it's really important that you try and get all players who are involved with your juvenile club onto the online system. Okay, so if there's new players involved, maybe at under six and under seven, it's a great idea to get, um, get a list of those new players from local teachers or, or possibly reach out to parents that you know have a child on the age and get their information and get that child registered. Um, because we know that it can be tricky for a registrar, it can be tricky for clubs to get all playing members onto this system. But once they're on, it's great. They don't need to be re-registered each year. Their, their, their details uh, stay on the system going forward. Um, and just for you as a club, it's great to be able to keep track of how many players you actually have registered in your club. So then from the children's officer point of view, now is a great time to make sure that all new and existing coaches are guard vetted. So obviously there's no new safeguarding courses being ran at present as in physical courses, but um, there are refresher courses available online for those who have already done the safeguarding course. So ordinarily you have to do a safeguarding course every three years, whereas uh, this um, refresher course allows you to get a two year extension once you have it done. Um, there'll be more information on that in the resources page that we have at the end of this presentation. So the coaching officer then has a huge role to play as well. Um, so it's a good idea for the coaching officer just to check in with your coaches at your various age groups. Um, you know, just a simple phone call, however, I'm sure most of you are doing this already, but it's no harm just to maybe just pick up the phone or send somebody a message and say, listen, how are things? Um, you know, how are you going? Just check in on the person themselves more than anything else. Um, but then after that, if the coach kind of says, you know, I wouldn't mind kind of trying to do a little bit with the lads if possible, provide resources for them to, 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 to be able to do that. So um, you can give them ideas or whatever. You, a coaching officer should have access to lots of resources that they can share with their coaches um, to, be for, to be able to set aside a program then for the players to be able to do. And also then um, you can provide resources for the coaches themselves to upskill. So you can give them fun do packs or give them websites of good content so that they're not kind of saying, geez, you know what, I don't really have that many drills or I don't really have that many ideas, I kind of stuck for ideas, particularly when, when you'll be dealing with players playing in a confined space. So a good idea then is to ask coaches to plan out their session, assuming a resumption of activities and provide help with this where necessary. So it's slightly a hypothetical thing, but it's no harm for, for, for you as coaching officer to say to a club, listen, if things did resume in June, what would the plan be for June, July, August, September? Now that might be dependent on, on the program of activities that we set up in Desha Og based on the time things resume, but it's no harm just to maybe have, for a coach to have a rough idea of what they might try and do when things do uh, get going again. It obviously now is a good time for you as coaching officer to make sure that there's adequate mentors with each team. Okay, so the GA requests that at a minimum, each group should have three coaches um, and now is a good time to try and recruit people to help. It's a little bit easier maybe to contact people, but obviously, like I said uh, at the start of the presentation, be conscious that people are, are obviously, um, you know, might be going through a tricky time, maybe work or could be self-employed or whatever, and now might not be a great time. But on the flip side of that, then there'll be some people who kind of say, you know, there might be an open door and might kind of say, listen, I, I, I was kind of waiting for somebody to ring me and, and I wouldn't mind getting involved when things kind of get going again. And then a club coaching plan. So that's something that the coaching officer and the committee can work together on. So does your club have a, an up-to-date club coaching plan? 
So some clubs will, some cl- clubs won't. But now is the perfect time to get the ball rolling if you don't. So then it's basically just a three to five year plan that covers all aspects of coaching in the club. So I've attached a, a sample coaching plan from um, a club from a neighbouring county just at the end of this presentation. So it's a good idea just to maybe go in and have a look and to see what clubs um what some clubs around the country are doing a lot of clubs in fairness put their coaching plans online so anybody can go in and view them so it's a great way to kind of get some ideas and to maybe take a a club plan that you've seen from another club and and maybe tweak it slightly or, or or figure a way that it might actually work for yourselves and like we said safeguarding guard of vetting it's important, like I said, you as coaching officer then can kind of link in with the children's officer when it comes to this to make sure that all new and existing coaches are guard vetted and have done the safeguarding as well. So the treasurer. So it's a good time, perhaps if there's any outstanding bills that need to be paid, um, now might be a good time to maybe to get them settled. Um, and also, but it might be a chance for a treasurer to maybe, if there's a bill due on regards to something, or it could be registration, it could be um, Jews towards playing in different competitions or whatever, it might be an idea to see if those payments can be reduced or deferred. So that's an idea that the treasurer can actually do just to maybe might have an impact on your on the money that the juvenile club will have. And then there's fundraising then as well. Obviously, even though activity has stopped, um, you know, we may need clubs may need to try and still continue to raise money to keep things ticking over, to keep the show on the road. So it might be an idea to have a rough plan as to what you might do as a fundraiser. <clears throat> so it might be an idea to prepare for a fundraiser which has no restrictions. So it could be a case of once restrictions are lifted, you might be able to have a barbecue or something in the summer, or you might have different fundraiser then maybe for the autumn or winter or whatever it may be. So assuming that there's no restrictions and that we're back to normal, but also it might be an idea to look at, okay, well, if this continues on into the longer term, is there any fundraisers that we can do um, over the next two to three months that might raise a little bit of money for our club and to try and keep things ticking over? So a great example of that is a brilliant fundraiser that I saw called Tier GA Club run a couple of weeks ago, which I believe they're also running again in the next couple of weeks, which is just an online quiz. I think they had 140 teams um, enter into a little online quiz. It was a fantastic initiative. Um, great for their uh, club members, uh, but also just a, a good distraction for kids and for families then to do something uh, and it just showed the positive inf- influence that a GA club can have in a community with something as simple as that. Um, you could also do some kind of sponsored challenge, whether it's like, you know, challenging five people in the club to, to run a 5K in their back garden and do a little fundraiser for the club or something like that, or online lip sync battle, whatever. There's loads and loads of ideas that you can do um, even though we're, we're, we're living in a period where there are obviously restrictions on movement and, and people are living in isolation, there's still lots and lots of ideas that you can do if you, if you try and think your way out of things. And then obviously just a reminder from the administrative point of view that um, we in Desh Yoga are, are happy to help clubs if club needs any advice or to need any help on structures or planning, just by all means reach out to us. We are continuing to work uh, each day nine to five like i said just give us a shout or whatever and, and anything that we can give you a bit of help with that we've rate that we've mentioned so far we'd be more than happy to help so then moving from the administrative side of things to the coaching side of things <clears throat> maybe what might be a bad idea so is uh for you as a coach in, in, involved this is not really coaching officer now per se but an actual coach involved with a group so it's a good idea to just check in with players and their families just to say hello. So it doesn't have to have anything to do with GA. It could just be a case if you pick up the phone and you maybe give each player's uh, parent or parent of each player maybe, um, just give them a shout or whatever, just to check in to see how, how, how they're getting on, how things are. Um, like obviously the most important thing that we're trying to emphasize here is that, you know, we should care about the person ahead of the player. You know, it's great that we have players in our clubs, but we should care about the person first and make sure that everybody's okay and everybody's um, getting through this all right. So it's important for the club to really try and drive the importance of exercise and fitness at a time like this. And that goes for kids and parents. So you as a coach have a very important role to play in encouraging um, that kids stay healthy and stay active. Um, you know, ultimately coaches are, are huge role models in the lives of players. So now is, is the time where they're going to need you or what they're going to turn to you and kind of say can you provide a little bit of guidance and kind of 
you know, you might maybe encourage younger players to try and keep active and, and to keep doing something in their club to, to, to try and get through this difficult time. So you can create a simple training programme for your players. Um, for younger players, just make sure that it's fun and challenging. And, and to be honest, I, I put down younger players there, but I mean, that kind of goes for basically any age group that you want to make it fun and you, you want to make it enjoyable, but you also want to make it challenging, okay? Um, we try and get maybe a simple programme just to be done maybe every day or every other day. Um, you know, kind of um, every day might be, for some groups, might be a bit too much. Um, but but at least every day or every other other day is probably a good a good uh, time frame to try and maybe do just something simple it could be half an hour a workout or whatever uh, with ball work or a little bit of fitness whatever way you want to try and do it. So if you're a coach who coaches both hurling and football, um, it might be an idea to maybe do every second session. One could be hurling, next one could be football, and so on and so forth. Or maybe do a week of hurling, a week of football, whatever way you want to try and do it. Okay. So I've just mentioned something here that a lot of you will be familiar with from your foundation course if you would have done it. So it's just to be conscious of the step principle. Okay, so when you're designing your training program, obviously there's not much point in saying, okay, guys, we'll get you to doing 50 meter shuttle runs or 100 meter shuttle runs if it's a teenage a group of teenagers. Um, you know, we a lot of people who are going to be staying at home or may not have access to a large green area, so they're, they're, they might only be able to use their back garden. So. The step principle then just um, we use that when we're, we're trying to design drills so the big thing about the step principle is that you're conscious of the space that you have the time frame that you have the equipment that you have and the personnel that you have so sometimes we might design a drill that might need five people or ten people in order for it to run correctly a lot of the, the drills or challenges that we'll have to design here will have to be tailored towards an individual or maybe two people working in a small area with just their own equipment so they're not going to have access to to size four o'neill's footballs or they may not have access to all the equipment or lots of hurling balls you know they might only have one or two so we just need to be kind of conscious of that when we're designing our training program and then another thing that we can do is the skills challenges okay so we've seen loads and loads of these on facebook and twitter over the last few weeks and it's great to see clubs and counties setting um their players fun skill challenges to do okay so there's lots and lots of examples. If you type in skills challenge G into YouTube or into, into uh, Google, there's going to be hundreds of these come up. So it's actually been one of the, 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 the best things about the, this tough period, about this period of isolation, is that people have actually taken an awful lot of time to design skills challenges. So there's loads and loads of them out there. So, uh, you know, simple ones could be like, how many solos can you do? How many pickups can you do in one minute in hurling? Could be target shooting against the target on the wall or it could be in one minute how many kicks can you get against the wall using your left foot then your right foot there's an infinite variety of variations that you can build into your skills challenges but the most important thing is just to make sure that you're tailoring them towards the age group that you're working with so we want to make sure that the really simple skills challenges the younger the player is but then as they get that little bit older you might build in um, might build in uh, a higher degree of difficulty just to make it that little bit more challenging. So the great thing about skills challenges are that generally if the skills challenge is designed correctly the child is competing against themselves so there's loads of opportunities for success and what we mean by that is a child can go out do a skills challenge for the first time and they might get 20 kicks against the wall using their left and right foot in one minute um, but then the next time they do it then they might get 21 and they constantly have a target to chase that's their own um, target so they're not trying to compete against another guy necessarily on their team they're just competing against themselves so it becomes a very individual thing um, where the child themselves uh, kind of lead their own um, lead their own learning and where they also kind of lead their own or they get their own opportunity for success they, they kind of dictate how successful they are And then from a coaching point of view, this is kind of for, from your, from, for yourself. Um, people will have a little bit more time to play around with maybe in the evenings or, or depending on if you're working from home, maybe during a break, uh, during your work. It's a great time for coaches to plan your sessions. Okay, so this is something that we, we, we constantly encourage clubs or coaches to do. But we're conscious that it's, 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 it's hard to get the time or to set aside an hour or two to actually design your sessions. So. As a little challenge for coaches, it might be a great idea just to design 10, maybe 45 minute to one hour 
pitch sessions and then just keep them in a notebook or folder for when things resume. So it's that way then you'll have 10 of them there. I know myself that if I, if I design a session, if I'm working with a particular group, I'll always try and keep hold of the piece of paper that I've written out the session on. And then down the line, if I'm running against the clock for a session or if I'm behind time, it's great just to be able to pick it up, look at it, and I know that I have a session done out uh, on a particular team that I'm able to, to, to use straight away. So build core skills into each session, but try not to build too many. So we would say no more than two to three core skills. So that might be one night you might be working on tackling and the hand pass. And then the next night you might be working on kicking with your weaker foot and overhead catching. So each time you're just trying to build uh, skills into as many sessions as you can. Try not to neglect any of the skills, try to build them all in over a period of time so that you're kind of ticking the box for each skill as you're kind of going along. So then also when you have your 10 session plans done, it might be a good idea just to put together a rough season plan based on a June resumption, a July resum resumption or an August resumption. So this will just be something for yourself that when things do get going again, you're going to say, right, well, I actually took the time to write down a one pager that just has okay, over the next three or four months, we're going to play 10 games, whether that's games that are organized by the Oak or whether it's challenge games, whether you have to go to South Tip or East Cork or Wexford and play challenge games against clubs there. But this is what we're going to do and we're going to train once a week or whatever. So it's just a rough outline of the season so that when things do get going, straight away then you kick back into action and you know exactly what it is that you're going to do. So I suppose an overarching thing or the biggest point that we want to try and make here is players want to be active and they will need guidance, okay? Because um, you might have a player there whose parents may not have any background in GA and who will be looking to you as the coach to provide them with a little bit of guidance, okay? So it could be something as simple as we said, like sending on a simple training program to all the parents on the team and ask them, can you go through this with your, with your, with your, with your son or daughter, okay? So it's a great opportunity for you as a coach to really make a meaningful difference to them during this shutdown. So it's a really, really tough time on children. Um, uh, so anything that we can do to try and keep them occupied is, is a good thing. Um, I have a two-year-old and it's tricky enough to try and keep him, keep him occupied for the day. I don't know how people do it with three or four kids, but it's great when they're able to <clears throat> get a little bit of guidance from you as a coach to be able to give them a small, simple training program or a set of skills challenges for them to be able to do so that way then they can go through it with their child and the child will be able to do it themselves then each day. So for yourself as a coach it's a good idea to upskill your coaching. Uh, now is a really really good time maybe just to, to, to chance looking at some books maybe listen to some podcasts maybe look at some website or online contact on, content on websites or YouTube or whatever it's also time to just think about your coaching, okay? You might be coaching with two years, 15 years, whatever the hell it is. Now is the time to evaluate, okay, how am I doing here? You know, do I feel that I'm happy with the way I, I coach my team? Would I be happy to be a player on this team? So there's lots of different ways we can upskill ourselves. Um, I'll just start off with podcasts. I think they're a great way to think differently about coaching. So it's great to be able to listen to experts or professionals and to learn from them, okay? So there's lots and lots of different podcasts out there. I, I put down 20 of them, but I'm just going to put down a few that I think would be um, helpful or maybe beneficial to coaches here. So a good one is The Coaching Bubble. It's produced by um, uh, Stephen Bean at DCU in conjunction with the Camogie Association. Um, he's interviewed, I think they've had two seasons of it at this stage now, maybe 20 episodes, all generally Irish coaches or people who are working um, in the Irish sporting environment. So it's really, really interesting and it's a really, really good listen. They're about 45, 50 minutes long and he's had some, um, some very, very good guests on. So then there's Pacey Performance, which is a, an English-based podcast, but he talks to coaches from all over the world, probably be more geared to people who are, are very, very interested in, in coaching maybe um, teenagers and adults and probably elite coaching then as well. Um, then the Talent Equation is also quite similar to Pacey Performance. Uh, the Irish Examiner podcast is actually quite good from time to time. Um, they do ones that are specific to coaching, so they get good guests on. Uh, Michal Quirk might be on, or Anthony Daly could be presenting and maybe talking about his time as a coach. They also get Dr. Ed Coughlin and a couple of other people then on to talk 
about uh, the whole coaching environment. And then another one that's going to be starting quite soon is one by um, Owen Mooney, it's called Coaching Children. Um, they haven't actually released any podcast yet, but I think it will be because uh, Owen works with Dublin GA, it will probably be very, the content that they will cover will probably be quite specific to, uh, to ourselves maybe as juvenile coaches. So books, there's a heap of books out there, guys. Over the last few years, it's we've seen a, a huge increase in the number of books that are even specific about GA. So some good ones that we've come across over the last while are The Carver Framework by Paul Kilgallen. Um, Philip Kerr has written a number of books about Gaelic games. Colm Nally has written some brilliant games, which are, uh, are brilliant books about um, just literally books of drills. So you can kind of, I, I have one of them myself and it's fantastic to be able to read it and be able to take ideas from it and modify his drills and to try and suit whatever age group that I'm working with. And then uh, Gerard O'Connor, the games manager with Dublin GA and Dublin GA themselves, uh, the coaching and games department have produced a lot of really, really good books over the last number of years. So any of those really would be a good starting point, but there's, there's literally hundreds if you actually kind of look for them. So it's a good idea to chat to people that you know are into coaching in your club and say, geez, you know, is there any good books that you've read over the last few months or whatever that you'd recommend? And, and make it part of your, your, your routine whereby, you know, every couple of weeks you're picking up a new book and you're trying to read it just to maybe take something from it. And always it's a great idea to try and read books by coaches in other sports, you know, like we, we, we all steal like great ideas and we all steal kind of drills and concepts that we see from other sports and we try and adapt them to our own one. Like that's the whole point of a... Uh, of being a good coach really is not having um, any fear to do that or whatever and it's, it's a good thing to do because you get a different perspective on things as well when you listen to uh, coaches and other sports. And then websites, there's obviously loads and loads of websites out there that people can visit. So ones that I found quite beneficial are obviously the GA Learning website itself, there's lots and lots of content on that. Um, then YouTube as well, there's a vast amount of, of session plans and, and drills and and talks that you can kind of go and look at. Obviously, I'm slightly biased, but I've put in brackets, uh, they show developed recently set up a YouTube page as well. And we have lots and lots of videos on on our YouTube page from our Southeast Coaching Workshop, which we would have ran back in February, and also the previous workshop that we ran in 2016. So there's 10 or 12 talks there from people that we will um, I'm sure people will find really, really interesting. So another good one then is I Coach Kids. It's a kind of a cross EU um, project whereby different people from different sports have come together and are sharing content um, that will be helpful to schools, coaches and to uh, underage coaches. There's loads and loads of great stuff on there. It's well, well worth a look. Um, just if people are interested in fundamental movements, I found the skullnet.ie page really, really helpful. It has really clear uh, descriptions of the fundamental movements um, that you would use in any sport, but they're helpful for people that aren't um, maybe comfortable in that sphere because they really describe all the various uh, movements in, in really, really simple and clear terms and make it easy to coach them as well. Another one then is coaching the game. Um, Colm Crowley, a friend of mine there from uh, Cork, a GDA in Cork, has had that site going for the last number of years and it's been really successful. It's a great, great resource for fun games and for drills for your underage players. I'd, I'd, I'd really recommend it. And then two other coaches that I'd recommend you try and maybe follow on Twitter and maybe uh, look at their content is FHS Performance, which is John Murphy. He does, again, lots of stuff on um, uh, games and drills for underage and teenage players. And then Shane Smith then as well is well worth to follow on Twitter. Currently, as at the moment, the GA uh, Games Development Department in Croke Park are running webinars each Tuesday and Thursday. Um, they're going to run right through until the end of this month and then maybe extended uh, beyond that as well. But they recently released the lineup of speakers that they have in the coming weeks and it's absolutely fantastic. So I really would recommend um, if you see that invitation come into your, your mailbox or if you see it online, sign up. You don't have to sign up for everyone, um, but obviously sign up for, for somebody who's their, their really, really good guests that are getting on this to, to take the webinars and there's a lot of good content being generated. So look, just a big thing then as well is just to learn at your own pace. I'm not for a second coming along saying that you're, you know, you finish work at five o'clock or six o'clock and then straight away you're picking up a book and you're reading or whatever. Dip in and out of these resources, maybe having going podcasts going in the background while you're working, something to listen to. 
you might read a book maybe once or once or twice a week or whatever just to keep yourself ticking over but just allow yourself time to think as well allow yourself time to kind of take a break from work and allow yourself time to you know maybe think a little bit about coaching wherever but just make sure that we're not you know constantly thinking about coaching either it's nice to kind of take a break from everything really and just spend some time with family so just a way forward so really right i suppose something just to highlight it's a really tough period on everybody personally professionally however it is a good opportunity for a club to kind of take stock maybe look at what you've been doing over the last few years and maybe kind of see look is there anything that we can kind of change going into the future so Obviously, you could do this at any point. You could do this when there's no lockdown or no shutdown or whatever, when things are still going normally. But now isn't a good, isn't a bad time to really uh, reflect on how you're kind of doing things and kind of say, look, is there, are we missing a small trick here? Is there some way that we kind of maybe improve the way we do things, whether that's improving your club school link, whether it's um, trying to increase the number of players that you have underage, whether it's trying to increase the number of coaches that you have, there's loads and loads of things that you can do. All of those things that I've just highlighted, you can bring under your club coaching plan. So do we have a good club school link in place? What procedure do we follow when we're trying to recruit new coaches? Um, what procedures do we have to try and recruit new players? Do we have an open night? Do we have um, you know, a free uh, camp at Easter for new players, whoever, just to welcome them into the club? Do we visit each school in September, October, and, and present each child with a little memento from the club just as a way of saying, you know, welcome along, we'd love to have you down the pitch or whatever. So this is all stuff that we can think about, reflect on, and try and build into our plans then going into the future. So what I would say is try and use the time as best you can to get ready for the resumption activities. So don't just allow it to be a situation whereby from the middle of March until for the sake of argument, if things get going again in, in June, I'm just using that as an example, um, don't have a, a situation whereby within that period of time, nothing was done in the club. So try to have something that you can look back on and say, well, look, even though the on-field activity had to stop, look, we managed to get a club coaching plan started or we managed to get all the players that are going to play with us this year, we managed to get them all registered on, on the online system, or we managed to get all our coaches uh, guard vetted and they all have their safeguarding up to date. So whatever you need to do just to make sure that you use this time as effectively as you can. So just a reminder then as well, probably doesn't need to be said, but like everyone involved in your clubs will be chopping at the bit to get back in action. Um, you know, whether that's players who'll be just itching to get back onto the field, the coaches there who'll be kind of ordinarily probably given out about having to go down to the pitch two or three times a week will be actually can't wait to get back down there, just get out and about and get back to normal. So now is the time, like we said, to recruit new people, put plans for this year and beyond in place and just get ready to kick back into action once activities resume on and off the pitch. So this, use this time and try and make the best of it as best you can. So I'll just leave you with a couple of quotes here that I kind of felt were um, quite apt. So one from Jorge Valdano, so just football is an excuse to feel good about something. Another one from Arrigo Sacchi would have been a great coach, a great Italian coach back in the 80s and 90s. Football is the most important of the unimportant things in life. And I've always been struck when I've, been, when I've ever seen those two quotes, anytime I've ever seen them. That's how we feel about the GA. For me, the G is the most important of the unimportant things in life. There, there's your family, there's work, and, and there's your friends. You know, they're the important things in life, and that's what we should concentrate on at the moment. But also, there's a place for the G and there's a place for sport. So it, it's just kind of something to be probably mindful of um, going into the future. So just the resources here. Um, Okay, so I'll send out the PowerPoint to everybody as well. Or if you don't have the PowerPoint, just contact me directly and I'll send it to you. So you'll just be able to click on the, the link then to be able to get into all the resources that we have. So there's just a club officer support link there to that. There's the what's involved in GA registration, guard of vetting and safeguarding, but the fund due packs for the coaching resources. So they're quite a good resource for anybody um, who's involved coaching younger players. And then just an example of a good coaching plan then from this Gould GA Club in Cork. I just have an example of it there. But also if you, if, you, if you type GA coaching plans into Google, it'll bring up 10 or 15 different plans from clubs across the, the country. And, and I would safely say that it, it's a good idea to, if you find a coaching plan that you feel you'd be able to apply to your own club, by all means, take it. Use it as a basis. Don't just copy it for batting, but use it as a basis for putting together your own coaching plan 
going into the into the future so that's pretty much it for me um, i'd like to uh, thank all of you for taking the time to watch this webinar um, i hope you enjoyed it i hope you get something from it i'm really really looking forward to seeing everybody uh, out and about again when we're back onto the playing pitch again so um in the meantime stay safe and we will talk to you all soon so on the far side of this um just before i go as well just to say that after this there'll be a short webinar uh, q a just with the games development staff in walford so if you just have maybe some questions or whatever or whatever maybe it might be covered in that presentation if we don't cover a particular question or a particular point in the presentation by all means send it on to us and we would be more than happy to uh, contact you with an answer or to do a similar webinar in the future and contact any questions that you have okay so after our presentation we said <coughs> it'd be a good time to do a q a with um, our gdas and with our post primary development officer and also um, the games manager with Tasha Oak. So on the line we should have Owen Bernock, John Quinn, David Robinson, and Stephen Enright. So how are you lads? Good, thanks Barry, yeah. Good morning, Bill. Thanks Barry, yeah. So we have a few questions that we've received from clubs and a few questions that were raised as well just from our own meetings. So the first question we're just going to cover here is um, a question that came in from a club with regards to um, our Tasha Oak giving consideration to a revised programme of activities for the remainder of 2020, be that one of competitions are coaching opportunities. So, David, maybe do you want to maybe explain the situation with that? Hello, David. Yes, Barry, I'll answer that one there. Uh, yes, once we're given to go ahead to resume activities, we plan to run a games program for all our clubs. This will be done in conjunction with our board and all town and country and city leagues and our own mid, mid county urban and western blitzes uh, we can't say exactly what form it will take either blitzes championships but we'll be looking uh, to give priority to the club activity okay super um owen do you have there just to add on that or um i suppose just uh, david is right and obviously people were aware that some correspondence came out from co park in relation to, to national failure and to the talent academy programs being being curtailed so obviously we, we would be we would be planning that the club activity, as David rightly says, will get priority at the club players, the one that has to get priority. And we've had a, a discussion with Borden and Oag, um, but we can't really plan anything. Um, but we would hope that we will, as soon as we get the go-ahead to, to go back into action, that we'll have a, a, as much of a programme as, as we can. Obviously, it mightn't be in the format that was originally envisaged and sent out to clubs at the start of the year, but uh, David is right. And I, I think what, what the GDAs will do in the divisions will certainly complement what's done at the board and Oak town and country city league level. Yeah, so I'd say the big thing is probably from the GA's point of view is that when things do resume again, that the club I'd say will be at the centre of whatever they're planning on doing. We all want the intercounty championships to be ran off as well, but but I think there's definitely um, based on what we've seen over the last couple of weeks, the the the, the hierarchy in the GA want to make sure that the club is the first thing that gets going. So it's great that that's probably going to take priority at all levels, whether it's senior or right down to juvenile as well. So just another question then, um, in the last couple of weeks, we've sent out club surveys to all juvenile clubs across the county. So every club should have received a club survey at this stage. Um, it's basically just a kind of a fact-finding um, survey, really, just a one-page document. So, Owen, do you want to maybe talk us through those club surveys, please? Yeah, um, I, I will, Barry. I, I've been working with the Day Show Committee in the last couple of months to put this survey together, and um, each of you have sent this out to the, the clubs in your divisions. And we have started to get a number back, and, and thanks to the clubs who have sent them back, and, and I know that you're working with them. I suppose this really will give us factual information um, to enable us to... to tailor what we do with each club on an individual basis and allow us to work with each club on the areas that, that each club wants to develop specific to themselves rather than trying to have a, a one-size-fits-all. Um, and I suppose what we've done is we've pre-populated the survey with information as we have it related to the number of members that were registered on the server sports system for 2019, the number of uh, children in the local schools as per Department of Education information we received, the uh, grades that clubs participated at in the various competitions in 2019, the numbers of the children that attended the school camps over the last five to six years to give an indication of, of where we're going, um, and then 
what we're asking clubs to do is to, to provide us information on the number of coaches they have at each age group and the coaching qualifications, if at all possible, for, the, for those people. Um, again, the number to verify the number of players we have in the registered system, we are aware that not every club, in particular maybe the other eight and under nine, ten, would have all their players fully registered, but it is critical that we do have uh, the full information. So what we'll be asking is that when you get this uh, survey and when you start to look at it, that if there's information that we have that isn't uh, fully accurate, that you would amend the information and, and when you're having a conversation with the, with the GDAs that you would make the GDAs aware of this. A number of clubs who sent in the initial lot of surveys have done this and have, have, have updated and amended the information that we have, which is good because it means we, we get a factual information. And I suppose then at, at the end, and, and this is where we're asking clubs to, to let us know where they feel they might need some assistance. Um, what action plans do you, need, do you feel you need in your club? What areas of assistance would you like the GDA to help you in relation to? And what we'll, what we'll be doing is once we get them back is we'll be trying to work with other people, not just the HO committee, so the county board, the development committee, uh, board and OG, and Munster Council if necessary, to assist clubs uh, in relation to areas. So maybe for argument's sake, if a, a club was having difficulty getting officers for the juvenile club, we could work with the development committee and do some training for officers. Uh, if, you're, if you're not as active in the club, local schools as you'd like to be, the GDAs and ourselves can facilitate uh, meetings between the clubs and the schools to try and get a programme up and running, um, help clubs put together a training programme, help with coach education workshops, help with, with session planners and with, with workshops in the club so that what we're really trying to do is to get real live factual information for every club in the county and use that information to tailor what we do with every club in the county. So we will get back up and running on, on out in the ground and into clubs and onto pitches sometime in the future. And what we'd hope is that we have all this information to hand that when we do get out up and running and into the clubs that we can be really effective in the clubs. So that when the GDAs visit all the clubs that we can be working on bespoke issues and bespoke projects for each club uh, if required. And, and even from the initial ones that come back, there's, there's some commonality in some of the areas. But there are a couple of clubs have come up with a, a few specifics for, uh, that they'd like to work on. And that will enable us then to, to use the resources that we have available to us. Um, so we have our, our games development staff. We also have other people in the, in the day show committee and the county board and outside of like that, as, as I said, that can help clubs. So we would, we would ask clubs that uh, would do your best to get this information back to us, hopefully by the end of April for all of the clubs. So if your club is having a, a committee meeting or if you're in touch with the GDA, that you, you would try and fill in this information as best you can and we can work with you from there. Super stuff. Okay, so we'll just move on. Um, so obviously over the last few weeks with the with the um, shutdown and activity, um, we've that will have a knock-on effect for our activities that are coming up in 2020. So just a question here with regards to what is the current situation with the cool camps for the coming summer of 2020? So John, maybe do you want to maybe just talk us through that? Hello, John. Uh, thanks, Barry. Yep, I'll take that now. Um, I suppose at the moment we are hopeful that the camps will proceed as scheduled. I suppose this, however, will be ultimately decided by the HSC in regards to, you know, having group gatherings together. Um, as I said, we wouldn't be 100% sure whether they start in June or it might be later and we'll have to look at what way we, we organise them, if that's the case. Um, I suppose the, the only thing we can do is keep you updated as the information as it comes to hand from us. But as I said, the GA would be hopeful that the camps will run as scheduled. Yeah. Okay, so as things currently stand, so planning probably for a 1st of July start or, or last week of June. Um, but obviously, again, that's totally dependent on the advice that comes in from the HSC. Okay, so another question then. So, what regard? What's the current situation regards to primary and secondary school competitions and visits after resumption of activities? So, Stephen, our our post primary development officer, do you want to maybe talk about um, the situation with regards to secondary schools? Yeah. Um, so, for secondary schools, um, so I've been in contact with a number of teachers. Obviously, again, it'll all be dependent on when schools commence again. Um, there's kind of a feeling around 
I suppose it'll be at the uh, discretion of each particular school or principal or whoever decides, but uh, we'd be hoping to offer um, blitzes in various age groups, hopefully um, just on a single day blitz, just to, uh, I suppose, uh, maybe run off the competitions or whatever it is. Um, but, I, but the way it looks uh, as of now, I don't think uh, any, unfortunately, uh, there has been games played and the various grades, but I don't think these uh, there'll be enough days left. In, obviously, the priority would be for schools to complete their curriculum, um, that they'll be allowed out for enough days for the competitions to be played off as uh, previously scheduled, that we instead that we'll offer a, a blitz day for each of the competitions instead. Yeah, which I think makes sense because obviously if schools do manage to get back um, before the holidays for any period of time, obviously education is going to take priority over anything um, anything outside of the classroom. And I suppose that's probably similar enough as well with regards to the primary schools whereby I know they'll have an extra few weeks to maybe round it with regards to them not finishing till the end of June as opposed to the end of May. But um, obviously again, when primary schools do get back, they'll have a lot of catching up to do. So it might be quite difficult to to get back into a regular routine of visits when it comes to the primary schools. That would probably be fair to say on regards to primary visits as well. Yeah, I think it would, Barry. Um, and I suppose this is the time of the year where a lot of clubs start to go into their primary schools as well. This kind of April, May, June period would be a busy time for clubs and GDAs to be in the school. So I suppose what we'd have to do is, is, is if schools do get up and running and, and it is possible to get back in with visits, obviously the curriculum, etc. cetera, will, will dictate that. Um, that we will have to work with clubs so it, it might be a case of the GDA and the club working together to to combine some of the visits or to to facilitate that it, that we try to get to as many schools as possible between the, the clubs and the GDAs uh, across the county because bearing in mind there's uh, almost 70 primary schools even if we started tomorrow it wouldn't be possible for the GDAs to get for yourselves to get all the visits to all the schools between now and the end of June so we'd have to work on that um, we had a number of things planned as as uh, for, for games and bits activities that uh, the three GDAs have planned for, for June. So hopefully they'll start the run. And again, like what Steve was saying with the secondary schools, it might be more of that kind of activity on a, a cluster school basis with, with some of the primary schools as well. Again, we, we, we'll, we'll speak to the Common and One School representatives on the day show and the Common and One School County Committee, and we, we, we'll take it from there. And we'll be guided by them, no more than Stephen was saying, that to be guided by the Post Primary Committee in the schools. That's great. Okay, so guys, so look, we've covered uh, a good few questions there. If there are any questions that clubs um, or indeed school teachers have with regards to what's going to happen after the resumption of activities, by all means, just reach out to um, any of us here in the Games Development staff and we'll, be, we'll help you as much as we can. Okay, so I'd like to thank the lads for giving their time and uh, we'll talk to you all soon.